Today, I'm taking you behind the scenes at Airbus into their future prototyping lab. This is where Airbus experiments with future capabilities like putting a pilot in charge of manned and unmanned teams. That is to say, a manned platform that flies together with remote carriers or autonomous wingmen. This work is usually carried out behind the scenes and doesn't have public access. So a big thank you here to Airbus and also to Griso, an Airbus test pilot, who's going to talk to us about all of these things. If you enjoyed this video, do let us know in the comments, because in the future I may always be able to get them answered straight from the source. So we're in Airbus's future prototyping lab, looking at HMIs in future cockpits. Next to me is Griso, and we're going to go through a scenario here, checking out what is possible on the HMI side potentially in the future. Now, what's happening here now? What you're presented with is a very, very basic scenario that's being used to demonstrate what the operation together with remote carriers or loyal wingmen would look like. Those are the three see. ones we see here. Those yeah. are the three that have joined on you and you'll be able to command them while tasks let them do something. Yeah. On the display, you also have that area of interest, that box here that yeah. you see there, that you have the pinching, pinning. And now if you want to go into your box, as you did it before, yep. uh, you want to task your, your sensor aircraft to investigate that area. And it's why the butt uh, oh, yeah, the appearance, button. right? There like, we go. Yep. And then we just confirm that. You confirm that. And, and it's going, going off. He's going off to okay. investigate. And he's going now, to investigate this area that right here, right? Yeah, that's yeah. it. And he'll go with his sensors and, and look for it. So yeah. in the future, obviously, and, and that's also software that's running in the background, mm -hmm. algorithm in the background, you'll have a network of, of uh, assets that allow you to use them mm -hmm. and they will choose internally which of their aircraft is best suited for the task that you hand out. So yeah. for an investigate task, you want to have a sensor platform, for example, EW sensors, radar yeah. sensors, whatever it is. The thing is now at some point you need to decide, okay, how much effort will a pilot need to have um, to, to give a task? In mm -hmm. this case, say investigate and the system for you now decides, okay, this is the proper sensor, this is the proper carrier for it, and that's what I'm, I'll be doing. Yeah. And obviously for the demonstration, now you have a pop-up target. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can take a look at yeah. it and uh, you go the info and put it on your screens. I'll put it on the B-scope here. Yeah, okay. So we've got an SA6 gainful system. What yeah. do we do now? Uh, we send out a strike? So right now, you want to send out a strike. Okay. Obviously, that's, that's what you decide as the human in the loop. Yeah. I want to have a strike, and again, you go with a tasking. Um, and the task will be engage the target. Obviously, oh yeah, engage the target, side. and we select the drone. Yep, there we go. And confirm that, and it's going off. And it's going off. That's yeah. the point. Now, yeah. and there's been a very a lot of very valuable things that you've seen right mm. now, and why there's a future prototyping lab. We started off with you know area of interest. We decide what we want to do with that area. Mm -hmm. Now the decision was we want to have it investigated. Yeah. Here in the cockpit, now we can derive a lot of things for you. What did you do? How did you use the displays you had? Mm. Did you do zooming? How did you do, do you use a touchpad? Do you use hands-on throttle yeah. stick? And so on. The next thing is, if you want to task somebody to investigate, how will I do that task? Will I have to sort out myself which of my assets are best suited? Or will the computer present me with the best possible solution? Mm -hmm. What do I need to reduce pilot's workload to a way such that he can operate in a very demanding big mission environment? Mm -hmm. Now, and that's why I say prototyping. You could go out and design all that on the drawing board. Yeah. Say someone sitting down and saying, I think that's what we need and this is what we need and this is what we need. That would be very old school way to do it. Successful in the end, but old school. I think it's more suitable to say, hey, let's design a cockpit and design a mission, a realistic mission in the mm -hmm. background. And this one is a small demonstration mission. There are bigger ones too to be seen. Yeah. And let's have operators sit in a cockpit and while they operate, we derive the information. Yeah. It starts with information about HMI requirements, information about level levels of automation that you need up to you can derive info like hey what type of uh, data connection will i need within my network mm -hmm. what bandwidth will i need what you know line of sight ranges will i be needing what will be the requirements for my command platform all this will be derived from simulating an operation environment so it's not necessarily going to be in the way that we see it now with quite close in rcs going with us but rather operating on a wider It, wider, it might or wider might ranges. not. Yeah. And that's the, the interesting thing behind this demonstration or behind the prototyping lab. Yeah. Um, we'll be operating in a whole different way than we're operating now. You have a command fighter you, who might be able to control a huge number of different assets. Mm -hmm. He might not even know which assets he's controlling. He might only put in a task for his investigation. Yeah. Because we don't know how this is going to look, will those remote carriers be close or not? 
That's why we go through these scenarios. Mm -hmm. In the background, you'll have opponents operating very realistically. So, yeah. it's, you know, this is the picture in the background. You, we had millions of simulations in operational analysis to have a realistic combat scenario and all that. Now you go here and you try, you take operators, you try different ways to approach a problem, yeah. operational ways. And you look which one is successful. And from that one that is successful, you can now derive what capabilities will my aircraft be needing. Yeah. It's a it's a basically reverse engineering the system from pilot's requirements. Yeah. A, a new approach, yeah. but I think a very, very uh, good one for the operator. Definitely. Now, we still have one last uh, drone left. What are we doing with this one? So, obviously, in the end, it's a BDA. Yeah. So, you want to have a battle damage assessment and send him there. And I'm going to send him off. Yeah. And, and he there will he goes. provide you with the data. And, yeah. and again, now you have someone doing battle damage assessment mm -hmm. that you want. Um, you can figure out, okay, is he going to be providing me with a raw data picture? Yeah. That would mean I would have good line of sight communication with a high bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Or do I have an intelligent system that does image interpretation yeah. and will send me with a result saying successful attack or not? Yeah. All those things will drive requirements for the aircraft. And instead of going to a drawing board and saying, I think this is the solution, yeah. you just go fly the mission and find out what the best possible solution is. and define your requirements from there. And I see our remote carrier has just sent us a picture that we have successfully yeah. destroyed the target. Okay, so that is a mission as a success. Now, obviously this is a future prototyping scenario. We're sort of limited here with, uh, with the HOTA setup that we have. Where do you see potentially the road is going? Is, is there going to be gesture interpretation, speech recognition, maybe trackballs? Is you know a touch screen like this realistic in the future? I think you've realized when you just interacted with the touch screen, mm -hmm. even in a scenario like this where the aircraft is not moving, it might not be the best option. Yeah. So you might want to have something to you know interact with assets. When mm -hmm. you saw the menu opening up, the rotary menu. Yeah. Well, you could touch it, but maybe there's different options. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the idea here. So, for example, for hands-on throttle and stick, the human factors engineers, mm -hmm. they do 3D printing, deciding all kinds of input devices, yeah. having a trackball, having, you know, gesture interpretation, eye tracking, and all of that is brought into prototyping labs, and you have pilots trying it out. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, you can say, hey, this worked well, this was, uh, was not good. And it's not only the pilot saying, hey, I love this, yeah. but you know, pilots will be trying it out. But then again, human factors and engineers, they will be analyzing pilots' workload based on their, well, eye tracking, based on what they're doing, yeah. but also based on, on workload rating scales. And you have a very good guess then what would be the best interaction system. Yeah. So I wouldn't be able to say it's going to be gesture or hotas or touch. Yeah. It will probably be a combination. But the best possible combination is figured out in the prototyping lab. Yeah. Now, there's one question I often get from people, and that is, now that we have these digital cockpits, um, not just in this demonstrator, but already in operation, how has that really changed the picture for the pilot? And also, what are sort of the backups? Because, you know, you don't have the basic six anymore. You don't have any analog instruments. If something were to happen to a screen like this, now I've seen earlier, you can set it up as you want, and I'm sure there's backup systems in place. Now, in any aircraft that needs to be certified, you'll have at least two different displays. Yeah. So it's one of the requirements that interpret here. The good thing is nowadays you have display technology where you have one big display mm -hmm. that has you know redundancy within it that's sufficient on a dull level to certify it. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that you can figure out here. So basically the display, well, half a display might break, but you'll still have the full display at a different resolution, as okay. an example. Now, if you, if you look at the changes for the, for the operator, you see it's a very large display and mm -hmm. you have here all kinds of options and if you look into uh, into it you've seen it before when you put it the info format it's in this case it's eight um it's eight different eight tiles, screens yeah. eight different tiles those are configurable yeah now there are different ways to do it you could have a standard configuration for every pilot mm -hmm. this would you know not make an optimum use of a system like that on the opposite you could have a system where every pilot can have his own design just as he wants to mm -hmm. but you know taking eight different tiles, now having probably the option to put 20, 30 different formats there, yeah. an operator will lose himself in this. So what, where you want to go is you want to have a couple of standard setups. Mm -hmm. And again, that's where the prototyping lab comes in. Now, because we don't know what works best and what works best in what operational part of the scenario, 
We'll just have pilots sit in here, go mm -hmm. through a scenario, we'll allow them to adjust their screens as they require. Yeah. And from that we derive, hey, at what points in the mission, during what phases of a mission, which formats will need to be displayed. And then the next step is to provide the operator with a form of automation or with a form of easy interaction with the system mm -hmm. to allow them to adjust as required. So basically you could have uh, one setup for takeoff, it switches over automatically into some sort of tactical yeah. requirement once yeah. you're in the air and changes back yeah. as you go in for landing. It, it yeah. might be something like, you know, you go for takeoff and it automatically reverts to a takeoff configuration. Yeah. Or it might be that you go, uh, you choose a sensor or you choose a target or you choose a task to be carried out and it offers you a configuration for that for that investigation, yeah. for example, giving you data from your sensors. On the other hand, it might be that, hey, it's a lot easier instead of, you know, designing very complicated display format automations, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to allow the pilot to very simply choose display suits. Yeah. And, I, and again, it's something I'm not sure yet what the boss best solution will be, and that's again where, where the prototyping comes in. Yeah. Um, and there's one thing about the automation, I, I, I'm very glad you bring up that topic. We very often put a lot of effort into automation, and it's an absolute must-have for many things in a very complex environment. Mm -hmm. However, every once in a while we go too far and we tend to forget that there still is a very well-trained operator, a human being in the cockpit, who might be able to do a decision or do a change yeah. in the blink of a moment without having any increased workload mm -hmm. where we would have to spend months in deciding automation. Okay. And again, it's very interesting in a prototype to see hey, where, where does it really help a pilot, mm -hmm. where is help not required, where is actually help distracting him from his task. And it's a, you know, it's a very mixed bag of things that you can see here. I mean, in, in a way, it goes a little bit back to our early conversation that we had. How much is the pilot still a pilot and how much is he sort of a mission controller? And now having interacted with these RCs, where do you, I mean, of course, this is a crystal ball scenario, but where do you see the prototyping for the HMI having potentially a spillover into understanding how we can interact with the, with the remote carriers and what the actual role of the pilot is in the future beyond just being a pilot. Yeah. When you, when early on you tasked your three remote carriers yeah. to do something, basically you told them investigate, attack, yeah. and uh, do BDA. Yeah. So in the background when you do that, those entities, they have to decide, okay, where do I need to go? How do I get there? Which mm -hmm. sensor do I use? How do I position myself to use, make best use of my sensor yeah. weapon? So all those decisions that if it had been a human pilot or had been yourself, you would have had to make yourself. Yeah. Um, the machines did for you. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, the, the whole impact comes in from the HMI and how to operate as a mission manager. Mm -hmm. While you were investigating an area, destroying a target and doing battle damage assessment, we had a conversation. Yeah. So it means, you know, this is something that will, would need to be done in the cockpit if you have, want to have more capacity for other tasks. Mm -hmm. Well, probably not a conversation with me, but yeah. maybe, you know, delegating other tasks yeah. to other assets. And that's what we, what we mean when we say how much is the workload and identifying a workload uh, on a pilot, the best possible way to do that is in a cockpit. And that's what, what we're trying here. And in, in this conversation, it often goes then into automation and what is automation versus autonomy of, of these RCs mm -hmm. platforms. Um, so what we are looking at right now is sort of the, the human is on the loop rather than sort of out of the loop as, as, as is sometimes portrayed, right? In the end of the day, it comes to down, I think, to a political discussion or mm -hmm. to a, you know, what is the political intention in the use of an aircraft? Yeah. My personal point of view, and it's really just me as Grisou mm -hmm. and no one else is, I think we will always have a human in the loop as the final decision maker. Yeah. He's the final one who gives the decision to yes, go attack or mm -hmm. no, don't attack, come home now. Yeah. And that's something I really would prefer to be. But again, it, you know, the level of autonomy is not, the, as you said, not the level of automation, but the yeah. level of autonomy will need to be defined by the, by the customers or the users. And it will be up to them to decide what autonomy do I allow my system. Mm -hmm. Our task as industry is to enable them to make that decision, yeah. to enable them to choose the level of autonomy that I, they want to be using. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do that, you have to offer all the levels available. Um, with the human in the loop. I think yeah. that's the one thing that we always do. We always 
consider a human in the loop as the final decision maker is a must have. Looking back at your career, you were a tornado pilot, you're a Eurofighter pilot. Uh, how much of this that you're seeing right now, is that, a, is that a sort of a quantum leap from what you've started out of as a pilot? It's both, to be honest. It's a yeah. quantum leap because suddenly you do things on your own with unmanned assets where in earlier days you would have needed 20 aircraft, 30 aircraft to yeah. operate together with 20 crew or maybe 20 pilots. Mm -hmm. So it's a quantum leap. However, the way of operating hasn't, hasn't really changed. At some point you will have a target somewhere. That target will be def defended by assets on the ground and assets in the air. Yeah. And you have people looking for you that you try to evade. It's still the same as it used to back in the old days. Yeah. Uh, just the players changed and the capabilities of the players. But it's, it's very interesting how rules that used to apply back in my tornado days when you flew into a target at 100 feet in low level yeah. still apply here. If you have UAVs, if you want to mask them correctly from, from enemy radar, they might need to be doing terrain masking or low level flying. It's the same thing, yeah. but it's different players. So uh, what is all this new again, in a sense? Uh, it is indeed. If yeah. you look at the uh, Ukraine conflict right yeah. now, um, the warfare there is very old school. Yeah, indeed. With very modern, uh, modern things. Yeah being used. Okay, Grisio, thank you very much for the introduction of, uh, of this future prototyping and the conversation. You're welcome. Thanks mm -hmm. a lot. I enjoyed it. A big thank you here to Airbus for the access and Grisio for the conversation. If you have any comments or questions, put them down below. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.